All right, welcome back to the underground auditorium here at API Days. This is the design and architecture track, and up next we've got Marco from Kong going to talk about moving from monolith to microservices. Thank Let's you so on. much. It's undeniable that in the past few years, we have entered a new era for software. The way we build our software, the way we deploy it, the way we connect it, the way we secure it, has fundamentally changed since the release of Docker and Kubernetes and microservices starting from 2013 and 2014. As a result of that, data, the data that our systems are processing, has entered a new state. As we all know, data can be in use by our monolith, by our applications, by our MapReduce queries. And data can also be at rest in databases, in data warehouses. The more distributed our applications become, the more decentralized, the more highly available, the more decoupled they become, and the more and more data enters a new state, it becomes in motion from one place to another, from one service to another, from one data center or one cloud to another. This is a fundamental change in how we are going to be building our apps. Because when data is in motion, we are transitioning away from the reliability of our CPUs into the unreliability of the network. We all know that the network, by default, is unsecure, is unreliable. It's slow. It can go down. And the network, it is the biggest variable we have to take care of when we build these new modern applications where data is more and more in motion. We're going to be witnessing a 40x increase of data across our systems. Like I said, the more decoupled, the more distributed, and the more all of these different components, they have to talk to each other in order to provide the final function. We're going to be building more and more data centers, and we're going to be leveraging those data centers by using public cloud vendors. We're going to be creating applications that are fast, that are responsive, that are able to target the end user in any region of the world, because at the end of the day, we want to be growing our business. And to grow the business, we have to enter new markets. We have to get new users but, and customers. But we also have to make the existing users happy, therefore providing them with low latency with a good experience. By 2021, we're going to be having over a trillion devices connected to the internet. That is a significant amount of information, of data in motion from one place to another, from one device to another. And we're seeing it today with the connected car initiatives that some car, car manufacturers are implementing, as well as the Internet of Things, IoT. Data is in motion. Every business is becoming a digital business. And when they become digital, they become distributed. We're seeing it all over us on all the products in our day to day. In order to build products that are reliable, that are fast, that are distributed, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We use public cloud vendors. We outsource that data center infrastructure to somebody else so that we, the teams, can focus on what matters, the end user, the customer. We want to be focusing on the actual final product. We want to make the product, like I said, distributed across multiple world regions. We want to make our products more reliable. And therefore, we need this underlying architecture and infrastructure that allows us to build products in that specific way. Building a modern architecture really is like building a city. We're going to be having streets and roads and freeways that we, the architects, are given to the underlying teams so that the teams can focus not on building the architecture, but on building the products. 
building something that the end user and the end customer will be happy to use. But like running a city, we need to be, we need to be able to have services on top of this infrastructure. We need, to be we need to provide electricity. We need to be providing the underlying system which would allow the data to flow from one place to another, from one building to another. Therefore, we the architects are doing that for the teams. We provide that electricity, we provide police departments, security. We provide routing, traffic lights, street lights, street signs. The more products we have in our systems and the more complex the underlying infrastructure needs to be in order to keep everything running in an organized way, it's all about connectivity from one place to another. Data is in motion. And as we want to expand and support all the teams in our organization, we cannot not take care of different platforms and different clouds. We're going to be having teams running on Kubernetes, teams running on AWS, teams running on Azure. The more platforms we provide, not because we want to have all of this fragmentation, but because we have to, because different products inevitably are going to be running on different platforms over time, maybe from an acquisition. You know, we acquire a product or a team that runs on Azure, and all of a sudden, we have to support that. So the architects have to provide a solution which allows all of these different platforms to be able to standardize on how we connect, secure, monitor, log, traffic control, all of these different services. And really is about connectivity. If we have a service consuming another service, if we have a client consuming an API, and that client, by definition, goes over a network, that request goes over a network, how do we make sure that the network is secure? How do we encrypt that communication? How do we give an identity to our services? How do we log it? And there's many answers to this. Perhaps the teams are doing that. Perhaps the teams are building their services and within their services are creating that encryption, that identity, that logging. But what happens when they do that? Different teams are going to be creating different services. And we've seen that before. Each one of them will be creating a new way of securing their software, a new way of encrypting their traffic, a new way of logging their data. It creates fragmentation. We do not want the teams to be doing that. For the same reasons, we don't want the teams to be managing their actual virtual machines. We want to provide them with an interface they can use, but not implement it themselves. Some teams perhaps are not even doing this. They're making a request to a database, for example, and they just assume that their request will always work. And when it doesn't work, the application is done, and the business is hurt. So how do we implement connectivity in such a way that it doesn't matter what team is making the request, what service, what application is going to be making those requests, but we always have that standardization layer which automatically provides encryption, observability, logging, and routing to our systems. One way of doing it is by leveraging a proxy. A proxy that's an out-of-process service which runs very close to our systems, our microservices. And when the, the, the microservice makes an outbound request, the proxy takes over that request, it secures it, it protects it, it routes it. And then on the other end, when the request is being received, we have a proxy terminating that mutual TLS connection, starting to log in that request, and then reverse proxying it to the destination service. The proxy effectively allows the teams to focus on building the app and assume that every time they make a request, it's always going to be working. Because the proxies are the contact points, not the applications themselves. And this um, really is the underlying concept of service mesh. Service mesh implies we're going to be having many different services, and each one of them is going to be talking to each other 
but they're not going to be doing it directly. They're going to be using this underlying proxy to establish that connection. For all intents and purposes, these proxies are creating an overlay network that allows these different services, not just traditional APIs, but any service, databases, Redis caches, memcached, whatever that is, to connect. It's an L4 overlay, if you wish, where all of these different services are going to be running. We're going to be having one instance of this proxy for each instance of our service because we want to give an identity to each replica we're running. If we had only one instance of our proxy per underlying virtual machine, therefore multiple services are going to be using only one proxy, it's going to be very hard to provide an identity to each single workload. But if we have a proxy running alongside every application, we can provide an identity to every single workload besides encrypting it. Mutual TLS is important, not just for the encryption of the traffic, but for, for the identity they're giving to the underlying workloads. And if one of those proxies goes down, only that one specific replica for that one specific service is going to go down. Not all the services in the underlying virtual machine. But of course, that proxy has to be very lightweight because we're going to be having lots of instances of that proxy for every instance of every service we're running. If it's not lightweight, we're going to be running out of resources. Now, when we have lots of these proxies, lots of them, obviously, configuring them and changing how we do things and applying new policies is going to be challenging without a source of truth. That source of truth is the control plane. The control plane is a system that is not on the execution path of our requests. It sits outside of that execution path, and it communicates with the data plane proxies, which, on the other end, are on the execution path, in order to configure them and pass the policies and configuration to them. The proxies are the data plane, because they are in between the data in motion from one service to another. The control plane, it's outside of that, and just configures those data planes. Data plane and control plane are concepts that are very popular in the networking space. Back in the days, and still today, if you're running a data center, you have many racks, many data centers, you have lots of Cisco switches, for example, and you want to configure those switches, well, you want to do that via a centralized control plane that stores all the configuration and then propagates it to the actual underlying hardware, right? Similar concept, except we don't have a Cisco switch, but we have a data plane. Today, the most popular data plane with lots of community momentum uh, that's being adopted in these kind of implementations is Envoy. So you might have heard of Envoy. Envoy, it's very nice because it's lightweight, it's fast, uh, it's built by Lyft, but there's contributions from all over the place. And most importantly, it provides a very nice API which allows to hook with third-party control planes. There's many of those control planes. Um, Kong, the company that uh, I'm the CTO for, has built one called Kuma. So Kuma, it's a very easy to run control plane that you can start using for implementing service meshes. I don't like the word service mesh. It implies you have to have this mesh of hundreds or thousands of services to get the benefits of this, of this new pattern. But it's about connectivity. Even if you have a monolith, talking to a database, and you have that network request, you can get the benefits of service mesh. It does not have to be necessarily for microservices. It can be used for anything that makes a request over a network. Now, if we are thinking about microservices, chances are that perhaps we're starting a new Greenfield app that's microservice-oriented since day one, or we are refactoring an existing application which chances are is monolith, and we want to decouple it so that we can make it more distributed, we can deploy it multiple times a day, and so we effectively take this monolith and refactor the monolith. This is only worth it if the monolith increases team productivity and business scalability, business agility. Whatever transformation we implement in our systems, they have to have a uh, direct benefit into the actual business. Otherwise, they become academic projects. 
Microservices is a, adds a non-insignificant complexity and requirement on our architecture. It's only worth it if it makes the team working better and faster, if it makes the business better. So should we, should we do it? This is one of the questions that I don't hear as much as often, but we should always ask ourselves. Transitioning to microservices, it's effectively transitioning from O of one, our monolith, to O of n. Teams and organizations that are struggling today with monolithic applications should not move to microservices. They should first figure it out on the monolith and then transition to microservices. Otherwise, their life is just going to get exponentially harder. Amazon, Netflix, these are all companies that have transitioned to microservices. They get lots of benefits out of that, but they also have built an, a, a company that's able to support this complexity. Not just from a technology standpoint, but from a cultural standpoint. The way the teams are working, the way the teams are going to be collaborating is going to be different. So is the company ready to transition to this new, new stage, this new era of software? But if the answer is yes, then we can start doing it. For example, uh, we have two different strategies that we can start adopting to transition from a monolith to a microservice to enter architecture. Uh, the ice cream scoop strategy, so we have the monolith and we scoop out services that over time we want to run separately. The Lego strategy, we keep the monolith where it is and we add a layer of microservice architecture, uh, microservice applications on top of that, or the nuclear strategy. We rewrite everything from scratch into microservices. Usually from my experience, what I've seen working a lot uh, well, better, is the first one, the ice cream scoop strategy. Because it allows the organization to move to microservices by getting wins along the way without having to change too much all at once. It's a very pragmatic way of decoupling monolithic applications. For example, let's consider this monolith. Each single object in this monolith is being represented as, as an object in the actual code base. It all runs on top of the same system. So if, for example, we're running a marketplace, think of eBay or Amazon, we're going to be having different concerns. We're going to be having user management, items management, billing management, invoice management. Different teams are going to be working on this monolith. This requires lots of coordination every time they deploy, every time they build features. The bigger it becomes, the slower the innovation cycle becomes as well on top of this monolith. It's just a large block of code, and everything has to work well at the same time, or that monolith will go down and the application will go down. So let's say that team two, one of those teams, starts making very frequent changes to the code base, and you know, they reach a bottleneck. They cannot deploy as fast as they want. They can then extract ice cream scoop strategy the particular part of the monolith that doesn't scale well and make it external. And then over time, if there are other pieces of that monolith that are problematic, of the, or parts of this new service that are problematic, <clears throat> they can then extract that as well, step by step, in a very pragmatic way. Every time we look at microservices, we're looking at an ideal world where every service is the same, they're all connected to each other. More pragmatically, we're going to be having services of different sizes depending on the actual boundaries that we want to extract. We don't have to start by making those services very small. We can always make them smaller later on. We start by making them as big as the business requires. Simple as that. So in monoliths, we have objects that are communicating with each other via function calls over a CPU. But in microservices, we're replacing those objects with services that communicate with each other over the network. That is the biggest difference, the network. The network, like we said, is the biggest variable between a microservice or enter architecture because the network, again, it's very unreliable. So how do we implement a better network to make this new architecture viable for our teams. 
Latency. Latency cannot be ignored. Latency will compound over time. Service A consuming service B, consuming service C, all the way back, that latency compounds over time. If our new microservice architecture is slow, the end user will have a bad experience. The in a monolithic world, when the monolith was down, the application was down. In a microservices world, when the microservice, microservices are slow, the application is down. Slow is the new down. Being slow is unacceptable. So how do we reduce that latency? Now that we have all these network requests, how do we make them more secure? How do we encrypt all of that traffic? We didn't have this problem with the CPU because everything was self-contained. But now that we have microservices, we have to fix that. How do we route requests to new versions of our microservice? How do we implement routing and blue-green deployments and canary releases so that we can experiment with different versions of our services over time that different teams are building, perhaps even in different technologies? How do we implement all of this logic? As well as error handling. A request fails, we want to retry it. You know, the network goes down all the time. So who's building this logic that allows us to retry those requests? And then, most importantly, now that we have all of these moving parts, if something goes wrong, it's very hard for us to determine where something went wrong. So we need to have logs, we need to have tracing capabilities so that we can get all of this information out of the box. All of these are all concerns that are new when we transition to a microservice rented architecture. So the service mesh pattern, like I said, implies having a data plane proxy that provides all of this functionality out of the box without the teams having to build that by themselves. These data planes are going to be used not just for our APIs, traditional RESTful APIs or HTTP APIs, but also for other APIs, like database APIs, like gRPC APIs. Any traffic that goes within the system will have a data plane. And that data plane will provide all of those additional functionality for us. Now, you must have heard when a proxy is called a sidecar proxy. The sidecar proxy implies that we're running a proxy for each replica of each service on the same underlying virtual machine. Therefore, the latency between the actual service and the proxy is negligible. The problems really happen when we go outside of that virtual machine to consume a service that's in another virtual machine. So we go to the outside network. And that is where the proxies are going to be useful for us. One instance for each service. The control plane sits outside of this architecture to configure the data planes in such a way that if we want to implement a new mutual TLS policy, or we want to provide a new observability policy, or a new routing policy, we do that on the control plane. And then we let, eventually, in an eventual consistent way, we let the data planes update themselves. There are different data plane and control plane implementations that you can explore. But all of them, they implement this basic architectural concept. Now, when we look at traditional API management, what is the role of API management in, the, in Service Mesh? Service Mesh implements this overlay that allows all the services to talk to each other. Among those services, we said we have APIs, we have databases, and we're going to be having API gateways. An API gateway, in the, con in the context of Service Mesh, it's a service among the services. The API gateway applies a governance rules and policies on top of the underlying networking traffic. Service Mesh is about the network. API Gateway is about governance and API as products. Likewise, uh, we can then use different technologies, of course, to create our microservices. This whole pattern, it's, it's agnostic, programming language agnostic, and even platform agnostic. Among the things that we can also explore doing is to implement microservices with, via events event-based microservices that are very good when we're trying to propagate the state of information from one place to another in an asynchronous way. Therefore, we can use things like Kafka, a log collector, which in the context of Service Mesh is yet 
a service among the services. And we're going to be using that Kafka collector to propagate state in an eventual consistent way across our microservices. And that Kafka collector will also be managed by a data plane proxy that will receive those requests and process outbound requests from the publishers and the subscribers. So to recap, we're entering a new era of software. The way we're building software is different. We're moving away from monolithic applications to microservices. That introduces new challenges. Some of those challenges can be implemented and fixed by implementing new ways of building software and connecting that software, like service mesh. We'll look at hybrid service mesh deployments that also include API gateways and Kafka connectors to implement more complex policies on top of the underlying network overlay, the extended architecture. Thank you so much. Uh, take a look at kuma.io if you want to implement service mesh. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.